give you an example. I, I was born in a village. Not many more people that are in this room. Maybe less than 100 people in the village of Brentisville, Oklahoma. One main road going up, up it. And we lived on the other road when I was born. My father was a postmaster there. This is an all-black town. He was a postmaster there, and and uh, that wasn't a pressing job with so few people in the town, and it, they didn't pay much either. So he had to do a number of things. He was a, he was trained to be a lawyer. He tried to practice law there, but how, how are you going to practice law when you're uh, maybe 150 people in the town? They don't all have legal problems, you see. And I don't even mention money. They didn't have any of that. that we, that we learned anything really about. But uh, I, looking back, when I got ready to write this autobiography, I said, how am I going to find out what went on in Rennesville? Well, my father was much more discerning than I was. And he kept the diaries. He kept the diaries. He talks about the day I was born, which I didn't. I didn't have sense enough to keep diary the day my son was born. So that uh, I was able to read my dad's diary and get some feel of what Rennesville was like in 1915 when I was born. That wasn't enough because he didn't, he didn't write about my playmates and uh, all the things that I was doing. And so what I did to try to piece together my own life in that early period was to was to go back to the 1920 census, the unpublished census, census, not the one that you see on the on the, on the shelves in the library, but one which is buried in the archives of the state of of North Carolina and Oklahoma in my case, uh, buried in the Bureau of the Census in Washington, and when. I was born, and for many, many years after that, the record was kept in the Bureau of the Census. Then they began to help have microfilms. They could film that material and make copies of it and send it around to the libraries. So that I was able to get that material from the library. I was working here in the, in the, in the, in the, in the city of the city of Raleigh, in the state of North Carolina. So the material was over in the North Carolina archives in Raleigh. And I borrowed it from there and worked on it here. By this time, I'm, I'm on the faculty at Duke, and I have my own secretary, my own everything, with the facilities to do the work. Now, the census was wiped out in the race line. They came along and wiped out every house, burned every house in, on the street where we were supposed to live. And it was, and we were packed to move. We were packed to move at that very time. It's, it's, it's the end of May. My mother's out of school. We'd pack. My father's going to come for us. Uh, and we we're ready. We we're really ready. Just sort of sitting on our face. And he didn't come. And he didn't come. And he didn't come. And it was really a week before my mother got any notion of what was going on. Then she read in a newspaper published in the Skokie, Oklahoma, 70 miles to the north, that there was a race ride. There were many casualties. And, uh, and that people had no, that that there had been all the spooking and burning. She didn't know whether my father was living or dead. And for several more days she didn't know. And she got a card from him telling him, telling us that there was this ride, which we knew about it, and that everything he had accumulated, everything he had built up, including the house he had begun to buy for us, Everything had been burned in the ground. Where he was, he was burned in the ground. So that he had nothing but the clothes on his back. Nothing but the clothes on his back. Nothing. And he said that he couldn't come 
prayer to Renfield and couldn't come to get us anyway. He would come as soon as he could, as soon as he got some money and could come. He would also, uh, it was also delayed because uh, he was trying to do something for his clients. And this is this is, this is a moment when he couldn't desert the, the people in Oklahoma and Tulsa because they were looking to him as a lawyer to help them. So he sued the city, he sued the state, and he sued the insurance companies. Uh, for no good, I mean, he lost all those cases for sure, but, uh, you know, the courts were not very friendly to anyone who wanted to place guilt on the white people in Tulsa for having destroyed the black part of town. So he got nothing out of that, but uh, he, he got a reputation, he got, uh, and, and people then feel that he was a brave, courageous, and resourceful lawyer, and that stood him in good stead in the long run. But uh, uh, that meant that meant we had to stay in Rennesville, this little village, for four more years. I was six when the ride came. I was ten when we finally got to move to Tulsa in 1925. But I was in a hand. Yes. Yes. Hi, my name is um, Justin Poindexter. Um, okay. My question to you is. You're a teacher, like you said. Um, what do you say to the young males and, and females that are in school now? How do you think we can get them to have a love for education like you have a love for education? You've seen so much in your life. You've been to so many different parts of the world. Right now in Durham, where you're standing right now, it's a struggle. People are starving for education. You have police officers in the school. How, if you could share any light or how, how do we get the kids to know about Duke? We got kids in Durham going to school, they don't even know about Duke. We can't even get them to even get a field trip to the college of Duke University. But we want them to be able to get an education, get a degree. We tell them, go to school, get a degree. I'm standing in front of you starving. I'm an elementary school teacher. I teach third grade. And I just, I, I just want to, I, I know you've seen a lot in your life. And it's like, I hear what you're saying. And I hear what you said about telling the truth. And that guy gave you the seats to the opera. It's the same thing going on right now. We're going extinct. There's not a lot of black males on the streets anymore. And I'm just crying out to you, sir, to just for any type of guidance. So where do we go from here? Okay. Your question keeps me away from it. I, uh, I worry about that more than anything else that I do. And I've made some comments about that in the final chapter of my autobiography, in the epilogue it's called. And I talk about that. And I say that the plight of black males in this country in 2006 is a metaphor for the failure of our society. You don't measure our society by how many rich people there are. You measure our society by how many successful young people there are. And this, our society is a failure, an abject, complete, 100% failure because of what it's done. Now, we can't sit down and sob about that and, 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 and let that go. We have to be diligent and vigilant 